The Unshackled Waves, episode 253. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome back to another Waves episode. If you watched last week's Uncuckables, you'll have noticed that I was coming down with a winter flu, which has kept me out of action for most of the past week. I must have given it to David Hiscock, as he has come down with the flu this week, so XYZ Live and the Uncuckables for this week have been cancelled. I'm feeling better today, so I thought it'd be best time to get back for another show. I only managed to muster the energy this week to attend Blair Cottrell's special directions hearing at the County Court on Tuesday in his appeal against his 2017 conviction under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act for his participation in the 2015 mock beheading video produced by the United Patriots Front uh, during their activism against the construction of the Bendigo Mosque. Uh, Cottrell and his lawyer John Bolton had been challenging his conviction under the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act arguing it violated Australia's implied constitutional freedom to political communication. However, a new development has arisen with the Victorian Attorney General Jill Hennessy, who only recently decided to become involved in the appeal, conceded that Cottrell's rights may have been violated under Victoria's Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. At the County Court, John Bolton made an application to have the appeal heard in the Supreme Court of Victoria, arguing that Victoria's highest court uh, could deliver a ruling of compatibility of the Racial Religious Tolerance Act with the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. This application was opposed by the Director of Public Prosecutions and the representative of the Victorian Attorney General, arguing it was not necessary for the Supreme Court to hear such an argument and it would be an unnecessary delay as the 10-day uh, County Court appeal trial is due to commence on the August 12th. County Court Judge Lisa Hannon reserved her judgment on the Supreme Court application until next Tuesday, so we'll keep you informed about what the outcome is. There is still a lot of other news to catch up on, with pedophile billionaire Jeffrey Epstein uh, arrested again. Tommy Robinson is heading back to jail. In Australia, the Religious Discrimination Act debate continues uh, to be contentious, and Facebook has decided it was above the law this week, deciding that some threats of violence don't breach uh, their community standards. To discuss all this, uh, welcome back to the show, who, if he has been in uh, full health himself, is the senior editor of the Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. As I said in my introduction, uh, flu season's been pretty bad down here in Melbourne. What's it like up there in Wollongong? Yeah, I mean, it, it is fairly cold up here as well in Wollongong. Uh, it probably isn't as bad as, as it is down in Victoria, but nevertheless, we do get our cold days. So um, hopefully it gets a little bit warmer sometime soon. Uh, every winter it seems to get colder. Well, so much for global warming. I mean, I actually think that uh, this year has been probably the coldest that I've experienced. I, I recall saying this to a lot of people that in the summertime, I don't remember a 40 degree temperature day. And it's something that we normally were used to, at least in my area. And also in winter, it's been freezing cold, um, like on, on a daily basis. It, it just hasn't really, even in May, it was so cold in May. Uh, so... I, I think it's been a very cold year, to be honest, when, when everything was supposed to be warming up, but I think it's going the other way. Yeah, bring on summer, bring on the, the heat waves. Uh, I, I look forward to it every year. That's it. Well, I'll tell you who will be feeling a, a chill uh, this week, and that's the uh, elites in the, the United States and in the the, the globalist uh, circles, because Jeffrey Epstein, the, the pedophile billionaire, he was arrested in New York this week on fresh child sex trafficking uh, charges and uh, conspiracy uh, to commit uh, child sex offences. Uh, now... 
Jeffrey Epstein, his crimes and he, him procuring underage girls uh, for sex in his mansion and uh, private island had been known for, for years. And there was an initial investigation in Florida uh, in the early 2000s uh, where the, the authority has uncovered uh, dozens of, of girls who'd uh, been uh, procured uh, by him for, uh, for sex. Uh, but the, the authorities in Florida, they uh, agreed to a plea deal with him where uh, despite all of these underage victims, he would only plead guilty to, to one charge of underage prostitution. He got a 13-month part-time detention order and part of the plea deal was non-prosecution of co-conspirators and Epstein he'd been he'd known to to have a uh, quite uh, high and powerful people fly on his private jet known as the Lolita Express uh, people like former US President Bill Clinton and uh, member of the UK royal family uh, Prince Andrew uh, so yeah th th this was a a major uh, elite pedophile ring that's been that had been operating for for decades yet he got the the lightest sentence you could possibly imagine for such a, a heinous uh, offense and for, for years like this is why uh, many people online have you know suspected there's you know there's these other you know, elite uh, child sex trafficking rings that's why the pizzagate conspiracy and uh, quantum uh, conspiracy theories have been raging throughout the the internet because they saw that somebody like epstein got away with it until this week and now a lot of people uh in those elite circles are now worried that's right this is something that has been happening for many years now and it's not a surprise to myself to you and to many of our um our viewers here and uh, people that tune in onto The Unshackled because we're one organization that doesn't uh, shy away from the truth. And we definitely expose all of the people that are, are doing these particular crimes, these heinous crimes. And the mainstream media uh, report things in their own way. I mean, they're very uh, strategic in how they go about things like this. And things come out all at once, even though, like you mentioned, it's been known for decades uh, by many and nothing was done about it. Um, when he did get um, a charge in 2008, basically a slap on the wrist, 13 months, this is something that, you know, anywhere else would have been a, a, a massive, a, ma a massive charge. And, you know, if he really is, is somebody that um, at least this time round uh, gets, um, get, gets caught up in, um, in the, in the guilty aspect of this crime along with many others then there has to be an expectation out there that they get um a very hefty very hefty penalty i mean a lot of people would call for the death penalty if it was anybody else so why would it matter to them that uh, they should be getting a lenient a more lenient sentence it just doesn't make sense to me that members of the elite uh, are getting away with these sort of uh, activities uh, they always talk about white privilege, but these people are the privileged ones here. These people, I mean, a, a, a working class white man down the road isn't privileged. These are the privileged people here. And they're the ones that are um, conducting all sorts of illegal activities, uh, whether it be uh, child sex rings, whether it be uh, drug trafficking, whether it be anything else um, that you could possibly think of, right under our noses, and yet, it just doesn't seem to get a mention in the media until, for instance, somebody chooses to um, uncover it. And then you also have to think of, well, why is it being uncovered now? Is he being used as a scapegoat, a scapegoat for somebody else, possibly similar to like um, how Weinstein um, uh, went through the same sort of uh, uh, ideal and then that brought up uh, about, about the whole Me Too movement and everything else in response to that. So. They have to be very strategic in this, and uh, it just doesn't seem like um, it is let out as soon as it is um, noticed. It seems that they really plan this, and things come out uh, at times when they need to be coming out for whatever reason, and I think we will learn more in the future what that may be. 
Yeah, it's not a conspiracy if it's uh, true. And yeah, the, the mainstream media, they now can't ignore it. And the reason why this has all come out now, these fresh charges, they've been filed in New York, not in Florida, which is covered by the, uh, the plea deal. So New York can still charge him is because of the, the work of uh, alt media journalist uh, Mike uh, Cernovich. Uh, he uh, launched a, a legal challenge to get the documents in a lot of the, the Epstein uh, lawsuits uh, unsealed so they could become uh, public. And there was also a, a journalist uh, from the Miami Herald, Julie Brown, who talked to a lot of the victims because, yeah, we're talking about dozens of victims. I mean, these girls, you know, they've had their lives ruined by, you know, this man in a, in a powerful position. And so the mainstream media has been forced to confirm, yes, you know, you're all right these people online you know this has been going on for like many years it's 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 all true but what they've what they've now tried to do is say oh no no he's not uh, bill clinton's friend uh he's donald trump's friend and there's actually been evidence that uh uh, his uh, jeffrey epstein wikipedia page was was edited uh a number of times to uh, try and emphasize his connection to donald trump over bill clinton that's right, I have noticed those edits actually, and uh, it makes you think why that is the case. Um, I mean, when, when this sort of uh, stuff comes out into light on the social media scene, it, uh, it, it really makes you thankful that we have social media to start with, because if we didn't, we just wouldn't know about these things, we wouldn't find out about them, and it would all be kept under wraps. So, yes, um, we did notice that Trump's name was kept on there and Clinton's was removed. Uh, we also, funny enough, noticed that his um, religion, for whatever reason, uh, was changed as well and he was no longer labelled as being uh, of Jewish origin. And uh, somebody actually put up a, uh, a an image or a screenshot and it said that he was just called white instead of Jewish now. Um, so that was another change that occurred as well. Um, but people have to understand that no matter who the perpetrator is, the victims feel the same. Like, people shouldn't be thinking at all that because somebody is famous that, uh, you know, that it wasn't as, as much of a, a heinous crime as somebody down the road that committed these. I mean, this, this is a really, uh, a really deadly sort of uh, a thing, and it's got long-lasting effects, you know. It really damages and, and traumatises these people. And anybody participating in such activity has to be um, taken down. They really do. And the thing that really upsets me is that they, people that are high up in society seem to get this power. And with that power, then ultimately that leads to corruption. And it doesn't only mean financial corruption, it's moral corruption also. And they feel like they can get away with anything that they're, you know, they're invincible. This is the problem with these people. And this is part of the reason why they do these things because they know deep down that they won't get caught. And it's about time that they do because people have to know about what's going on. And if people like us or anyone else isn't reporting on this, then nobody knows. And that's why the, the alt media especially is very vital in providing these details to the public because they won't get this from the mainstream media at all. Now, the reality of uh, Trump's connection to, to Epstein is like, yes, they were associates, but as soon as Trump learned about uh, his you know, dealings with these, you know, procuring these underage girls, he kicked him out of his uh, Malaga golf club in, in 1999. I, I did realize that they raised a 2002 quote from Trump where he, you know, said about uh, Epstein, oh, you know, he likes the ladies, especially uh, likes them young. And a lot of people interpret that, you know, Trump's trying to warn people that this is what this guy's about. Meanwhile, Bill Clinton had had 26 uh, trips on the uh, uh, Lolita Express, his, his private jet, and he's put out a statement, Bill Clinton saying, I know nothing of Epstein's, you know, crimes. This is uh, a total shock to me. I've enjoyed the, the, the jokes about Bill and Hillary Clinton tweeting, um, I'm sad to learn of the impending suicide of uh, uh, my close friend, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, when something like this comes out, uh, ultimately you would think that uh, the people involved 
will do anything it takes to shut them up and to make sure that this doesn't go ahead. I mean, this really is life or death to them. Uh, it, it not only damage their careers, it will damage their lives if they are to get in, um, involved in this saga. And we've seen in the past, that whenever people high up in the elite have been challenged or have been threatened in any way, that dramatic things happen. You just have to put facts with facts. You have to really look at what's going on and, and put things together and come up with a conclusion here as to what, what really is happening behind the scenes. Um, 26 times on his plane, yet you know he, he says nothing, nothing's out of character there, nothing to see. I really, I really don't see how people can start buying this now. You know, it's, it's just gone on for too long, and I'm just really hoping that this leads to other arrests in the future, and that it expands, and that the whole establishment and you know the the media, the, the Hollywood elite, all the people involved in these things just get exposed. That's what needs to happen, and they need to be punished for it. Uh, Christine Pelosi, who is uh, Nancy Pelosi's daughter, has said that many high-profile people will be implicated in uh, this new Epstein investigation from both sides of politics. It's still very early in the uh, investigation, uh, and Epstein's only just been been charged. But once the the genie has been let out of the bottle, that you know we're going to reopen this and uh, lay fresh charges. You know, you, you can't just have them make the the issue or, of, or or these crimes go away again. Like they have to be investigated properly because this is the public have been demanding this for for years. Like as soon as they've been able to, you know, know about, you know, just how 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 outrageous the the initial plea deal was. I mean, uh, you know, for for the public once. Uh, uh, shame on you, but you know you're not going to fool them again. Yeah, and one thing that actually I I wonder is uh, how Christine Pelosi has come out and actually said something like this. That you should you'd think there'd be repercussions for her as well, because um, by her saying that she basically is is stating in a way to us that she knows who's involved, which means that this is something that is well known by many people, yet nobody has actually came out previously and said anything about it. So everyone's covering it up. You know, otherwise, how would she know who's involved, um, that there's so many high-profile people that uh, is going to get implicated? Like, how would she know? Obviously, she knows who these people are. She's even mentioned that it's people within the Democratic run for the presidency um, in that race. I mean, you'd have to look at people maybe perhaps like Joe Biden. I mean, you'd think he's an obvious one, but it could be anybody. It could be people you least expect because at the end of the day, it, it isn't a face value thing. It could be anybody. Anyone that's in the establishment is bound to do the wrong thing with this power ego uh, drive that they end up getting in that position. And it corrupts them, really ultimately and um, I mean it's, it's really just um, anything anything that we that we would have thought in the past about this situation here her coming out and saying that has confirmed everything it's basically confirmed that this is well known um, within many people that um, these particular people which will at the end of the day get implicated um, that they were well known amongst many that they were participating in these crimes and yet nobody chose to say anything why didn't they choose it because it might damage their careers it might ruin their lives in some way or another and it seems to me that people put these sort of uh priorities ahead of the priorities of the kids that are getting um molested and trump's also been uh, attacked uh, because his Labor Secretary, Alex Acosta, was involved in the, the two, 2008 plea deal with Epstein uh, uh, down in, in Florida. But he was confirmed as Labor Secretary not just by a vote of Republicans, but uh, Democrats. And yeah, I would like to know the reason why Trump decided he was appropriate for, for Labor Secretary. There were probably other considerations going on uh, as well, but you know, it's... 
uh, it's clutching at a very uh, minor thing. It is, yeah. I think anything to um, basically rattle uh, rattle these particular people like Trump and stuff, they'll, they'll try and point to any sort of um, connection that, that they, they could possibly make. Uh, at the end of the day, though, regardless, uh, what needs to be exposed hopefully will be and we will get some answers sooner or later because that's what, what it's all down to. It doesn't really matter um, who it is that's involved. Uh, we just really need answers. We need these people punished. And we have to make sure that these um, particular people aren't protected any longer, that they aren't given these, uh, these uh, endangered species particular uh, classifications. Um, they're doing the wrong thing. They need to pay the ultimate price. You know, I mean, we have to send a message and that's the message we need to send. Tommy Robinson, the UK British Values and Anti-Islam uh, campaigner, he's just been sent uh, back to prison after he's, he was found guilty last week uh, at a retrial for contempt of court. This was for filming outside a Muslim uh, grooming gang trial in Leeds in May 2018. He was initially at the time summarily sentenced to 30 months in, in prison, uh, which spurred the Free Tommy movement. He was released in August after his conviction was quashed and a retrial was ordered by the British uh, Court of Appeal and he was out on bail pending that uh, that retrial but he was found guilty again last week. Now he's been sentenced to a total of nine months imprisonment, six months for the contempt of court and a three-month activation of a suspended sentence but the court already has taken into account time served, 10 weeks in solitary confinement so he's going to be maximum in prison for 19 weeks but there's a mandatory early release of uh 9.5 weeks so he'll spend 66 days in jail which is not as much as as people feared but uh, we all knew once this guilty verdict came back that he was headed back to uh, prison and so it's not that that, that great surprise but it, it seemed that the, the uk authorities they were sort of afraid to sort of you know lock him away for forever again, given that the outrage it caused last time. Yeah, that's right. It seemed to spark an outrage, um, a bit of a, a counter-reaction um, with his uh, sentencing and conviction last time around. And, I mean, a lot of people just don't understand how it is that such a law could exist, that they could actually... Uh, sentence him in the first place for for what he particularly did. Um, a lot of people don't understand how filming outside of a um, outside of this uh, particular trial how this was a uh, an offence. You know, people just can't believe it. You know, something so simple yet it can land you so much time in jail. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't even know what what the laws are. You know, I mean, we're not we're not actually taught about all this. So a lot of people thinking they're doing something innocent. Yet then they get caught up in these sort of things and once you are then that's it you know you can go to jail for a good year or so and um it it really sets a precedent that that's a bit scary that people can't even do the simple things of, of filming uh or even you know basic freedoms you know basic freedoms i mean um filming outside of out of a court place i mean you know it's, it's you know, really basic, really basic, um, something that you'd expect in, in, in a society to, to grant, yet um, something that seems to be really taken for granted because, um, you know, these kind of charges take place. Uh, so I think, I think it's something that uh, will happen in the future more often, uh, as we see um, in, in many cases more of a police state kind of uh, um, impending on speech or impending on... Uh, on different particular things. Uh, anyone that's considered far right, for instance, is definitely, you know, I mean, looked at and, and you know, they're just watching for any move out of, out of the norm and they'll just pounce on those people. So this is something that people have to be wary of. It's really scary times, unfortunately, but uh, this is the sort of thing that we're, um, the future we're heading down. Well, they've claimed that his live streaming outside the trial that uh, jeopardised the, the trial and could have caused a, 
uh, a mistrial, but his defense was, well, he, he, was, he wasn't reporting anything new that mainstream media wasn't uh, already reporting. It's, it seems to be because they, he wasn't a traditional journalist and was seen as an agitator. And of course, we know there's these human rights lawyers who are looking for, you know, perversions of justice and like to get, you know, people like these, you know, uh, Muslim groomers off on a, on a technicality. I mean, I, I do think a lot of sort of, you know, these sort of like reporting, you know, restrictions in the social media age, they're, they're quite outdated. I mean, they, it was demonstrated with uh, the initial Cardinal Pell uh, conviction here in Melbourne. It couldn't be reported here in Australia, but everyone overseas knew and like anybody who wanted to know could could find out. So I sort of think we've got to rethink the, this sort of, you know, like aspect of our, our, our justice system because it, it it just seems so i mean like do they do they really think that you know like jury members these days are you know like they're they're never ever influenced by you know anything else or you know they're that stupid that you know they can't you know make a make a rational judgment based on you know the evidence it's really antiquated stuff well, of course, the jury members are, um, uh, are pushed in certain ways. Uh, there, there's always going to be a bias, whether it's a bias for or against the person uh, that is being charged. We, it just depends on the, on the particular case at hand. But everybody, every individual leans a particular way, whether it be politically, whether it be their religious belief, their, um, their opinion on whatever matter it is. And that's why, um, in many ways, the, the jury sort of um, system or the way of um, going about deciding a case in a lot of ways can be flawed because how do you know, well, how can you actually judge that um, this particular jury isn't biased? I mean, there's no such thing as non-bias. Everybody's got bias. Um, you know, people can be a little bit more silent and a little bit less um, out there and seem to be a little bit more, you know, borderline or in the middle, but at the end of the day, everybody has their views implanted, just some are louder than others in sharing those views. So when people go into a, uh, a court and they're asked to decide on a trial, you're already leaning one way or another, even before hearing the case, because that you have that particular bias to the, a particular situation that is presented to you. Um, so it's just, it's a very complex thing. I think it's definitely something that needs discussion. How they solve this sort of issue, I'm not sure, but it's definitely something that needs to be spoken about. And yeah, it's something that we're going to continue to see, that's for sure. Like I said, the the sentence is not as long as some of his supporters fe feared because there's a, a great fear that he could die uh, in prison because there is such a large Muslim uh, popula population in UK prisons. And when he was last in prison, he refused to eat the prepared meals because they were prepared by Muslims and just uh, survived with tuna. And he, and he lost uh, about uh, 40 pounds um, during, uh, uh, during his last day in prison. But unless there's gross negligence on the part of the UK uh, correctional authorities, you know, he'll be out in uh, 66 uh, days and he'll be able to continue uh, his activism because he's still been pretty busy uh, even you know while he was facing this retrial um, he had his uh, panodrama documentary exposing the uh, the BBC uh, manipulation of the the reporting of him he ran in the the UK EU elections in the northwest region of England got uh, two point two percent of the the vote there and uh, the social media companies, they did all they could to try and cripple his reach. He was banned from Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, PayPal. He was working on a, another uh, documentary called uh, Shalom, uh, which was about um, a Jewish exodus from uh, Europe because of the, the increasing Islamization of the, the continent. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that would be something um, very interesting there. Um, it's not something that you would hear very much on the news about, but nevertheless, uh, on, the, on this particular topic, it, it's something that, I mean, well, what people have to understand is there's many uh, bloggers, many people on YouTube and, and other social media accounts that uh, like to uh, um, 
you know, have news coverage, they'd like to, you know, do podcasts and all sorts of things. And when they see somebody like him um, going to prison, that automatically sends a message, a shockwave through that movement of people and says, you could be next. And a lot of people are scared. Like a lot of people are genuinely thinking, maybe I shouldn't be talking anymore. Maybe I should be, you know, quiet and just go with the flow because I could be next in prison. Um, this is really influencing a lot of people. I mean, for instance, you've got people like Southern and so forth that aren't doing it anymore. They've retired. You know, they've run away from the cause. So this is definitely, you know, the, the whole shutting down, whether it be um, either throwing people in prison as, as to that extent or even just shutting down on, on social media. It's trying to give um, the people out there that are even contemplating getting in, involved in, in this sort of movement, that this could be your fate. And it really makes people afraid. And it changes a lot of people's minds that are thinking of getting involved in politics or, or doing something, you know, um, podcasts, blogging and what whatnot. And it really, it changes their opinion on it because they're thinking, well, hold on a second. Um, I really want to give feedback and, and, and provide discussion as to something I'm passionate in, but if this is going to be what's going to result in it, is it really worth me, you know, taking that risk? And I think that's something there that, you know, anyone has to take into account when, when they're trying to go down. And it's really, it's a sad situation. I mean, it's not something that we should be having to think of, but unfortunately we are. And Tommy did launch a, a last-minute uh, appeal to be granted asylum in the United States by President uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this was never going to happen. Trump was never going to involve himself in in the affairs of the the UK government uh, like this. I mean, last year Tommy Robinson couldn't get even get a, a, a visa to the United States for a political uh, talk. So you know. Uh, Trump, you know, he's, he hasn't got a, you know, magic wand to sort of sort of fix these uh, things. So it sort of was a sort of a bit of a a, a desperate uh, stunt. But but like I said, um, yeah, he'll get through this, uh, Tommy. And I mean, he he may tread a, a bit more lightly in the in the, in the future now because he doesn't want to keep going to uh, to prison. Um, but yeah, there's still plenty of plenty of things he can either do, you know, pr produce these documentaries, you know, he can do a few more runs for political office. There's still lots lots he can do and sort of, you know, make sure he, you know, d doesn't doesn't get locked up again. That's right, and I, I don't think um, we we could really rely on Trump uh, doing anything here. I mean, he hasn't even really uh, um, shown any support behind uh, Assange. So if he's not willing to back him, then I, I don't think we can really um, expect him to back anyone else either um, and to really uh, grant him asylum or to, to give him any help in any way. No. Back in Australian politics, there's a growing pressure on the, the coalition backbench for the Morrison government to pass a Religious Discrimination Act. This is because the, the Israel Folau uh, dispute with, with Rugby Australia after they sacked him over his sinner's Instagram uh, post uh, continues to snowball. And it's being led by uh, Liberal Senator Conchetta Ferrovansi Wells, who uh, she actually wants to go further, have a religious uh, freedom act. Now, Attorney General Christian Porter, he's been consulting with with backbench uh, MPs. Now, this is more complicated than a lot of people think because they sort of think that if you pass a religious discrimination act, it'll make sure that you know somebody like Israel Folau can't get fired. But it's if you if you it's it's not simply like if you pass a religious discrimination act, you're not you know, simply protecting Christian religious beliefs. You're also protecting uh, Islamic and other uh, unsavory uh, views, which are uh, beliefs that are dressed up in, in religion and potentially excusing that. I mean, what if you have a, a worker in your company who's advocating for Sharia law, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, child marriage, polygamy, like they can pretty much say that and you can't do anything about it. It basically gives them a green light to, to, to basically, you know, spout 
extremist uh, beliefs, and so it, it can it can really be a, a double-edged sword here. It definitely is, um, and I think that's why, for instance, Pauline Hanson has come out and opposed it um, because of that reason. The only problem is, I mean, at the end of the day, we really have to look at it this way. I, I don't really see how uh, it should be legal for a, a boss to sack an employee because of a particular religious or political belief that they may hold. I mean, um, especially if they're holding it outside of work hours, it's not something that should happen. I mean, these are the sort of people that um, don't want us to, or want us to move away from the freedom of association uh, sort of laws that we used to have where, you know, particular premises uh, used to ban uh, members of certain races or certain religious groups or whatever. Yet at the same time, they're doing the exact same thing that they used to do back then, which is something that they would have opposed. But because it's a minority group here, it makes a difference somehow. You know, they seem to, it seems to be really um, not the principle. It seems to be depending on who it is that it's affecting. So all in all, really, when it comes down to it, I, I just don't understand how well, Falao really could have in his contract that um, prevented him from being able to hold religious views outside of his workplace, how that could be legal. And I think having something in place that would prevent that would be a good thing. I know that it may, came, it may come ultimately with, with consequences in other ways, but you have to really look at the pros and cons here. And I think really when it comes down to it, um, especially with what we're facing at this current stage, it really, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to really look at this and, and come up with the best solution. But ultimately, I don't think that somebody works for a particular employer doesn't have a life outside of their work. You know, they, they, they should have the right to hold a belief and to be able to say whatever they wanted on social media and, you know, and it doesn't matter what the employer thinks because that person isn't getting hired for his beliefs. He's getting hired for doing the particular job. And the particular job has nothing to do with the beliefs in question. Um, if it's a sports star to do, you know, what he does best and that's play sport. So I don't understand how that could be a conflict of interest there and how they would want to not be able to associate with somebody just due to those beliefs. So to me, that doesn't make any sense. Well, the argument is that it's a breach of contract dispute because he'd agreed not to use social media in this way. And it's argued that, well, he's only got that following on, on social media because he's an employee of, you know, Rugby Australia or isn't he an ambassador uh, for the game. Like, for example, if they, you know, sacked him for, you know, what he said in his church, I mean, that would be pretty outrageous when he's, you know, just there on a Sunday, basically expressing his religious beliefs in a, in a, in a private, a, a religious house of worship. Uh, I think that would be outrageous, but it, se it seems to be that because it's sort of, it's, it seems to have spilled over into his work that this is where it's, it's going to come down to in the, uh, the court case. And I definitely feel that, yeah, you, you are entitled to, like, outside of work, your, your own uh, religious uh, beliefs. And I think the, the tricky thing here is, is, like, you know, where do you draw the line between, you know, when somebody's acting as a ambassador for your company and when they're just being a, a private citizen? Because uh, corporations these days, they're wanting you to be ambassadors for the... Uh, their company 24 hours a day. I mean, how many times, you know, have we heard of uh, corporations sacking, you know, workers because they've done some unpopular political activism? Yeah, and I think that's the problem there. I think it shouldn't be like that. I think that people that are, um, that are working in these sort of environments do deserve to have that private life as well as their public persona. They, they can't be ambassadors 24 7 i think that's ridiculous to to expect that of anyone really um i mean we're, we're not talking about a, a politician here which is a public servant and that you know is representing us and has to be you know 
squeaky clean at all times. I mean, if, if this person uh, participated in a crime, it would be a different matter, of course. But then again, um, like the popular meme suggested that I've seen only about a week or two ago, that it seems that if somebody gets involved in drugs or somebody gets involved in domestic violence, they get less of a, uh, you know, a less of a um, uh, punishment than somebody just uh, displaying their religious beliefs. You know, th this is how far this has gone here because these particular corporations expect their um, their employees to uh, push this progressive uh, tagline, and this has nothing to do with sport, and nobody wants it. To to have anything to do with sport. I mean, this uh, particular person, if we're speaking about Falau in particular here, he was exceptional at what he did. So he was automatically fulfilling his role to the fullest. He was doing everything that he was asked to um, in that job as being a, a great you know, rugby player. So anything outside of that, it, it just to me, it, it just doesn't fit that role. I mean, it, it shouldn't be in his role of duties that he has to uh, push a progressive um, a line, or that he, you know, should not go on social media and hold certain views that um, the person in control of this corporation disagrees with. I mean, this isn't what it's about. I mean, and I mean, when it comes to association, the majority of people. Um, that watch rugby and that even watch Falau, they watch him for the sports star that he is. They don't watch him because of his uh, his activist beliefs. And I don't think people uh, would associate Rugby Australia for holding those beliefs just because Falau did. I think that's where people have it mixed up there. And if they didn't make such a scene about this to start off with, nobody would have even batted an eye over it. And it would have been long forgotten and nobody would have cared but because they proceeded to to make this such an issue that's why it's gone down this road so far i mean if somebody came out and said the exact opposite thing and promoted lgbt sort of lifestyles or something a bit controversial in that sort of section of the community it would have been praised it wouldn't have been condemned but then at the same time, if Rugby Australia had a Christian conservative leading it, could he have come out and said, you know what, that person goes against the, you know, the beliefs of, of, of myself and of, of this corporation and, and they should be shunned for it. I mean, imagine the outcry. I mean, would they be allowed to do something like that? Would it be a, a, a different set of, uh, you know, opinions that people would hold in if it was uh, roll, roll switches there? Well, look at the the rugby league uh, this week, where the the NRL uh, chairman Peter Beatty, former Queensland premier, has said uh, during because uh, this week is is NADOC week, uh, which is National Aboriginal and Islander Day Observance Committee Week. That's that's quite a mouthful. Uh, we, I, we we just had what's that uh, reconciliation week? Uh, I think a few a few weeks back. So there's a another one here. Well, uh, the NRL has decided to endorse the the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which Aboriginal leaders have signed, calling for the the federal government to enshrine an Indigenous voice to Parliament in the the constitution. And we've seen this week the Liberal New Indigenous Indigenous, meaning that it's an in uh, Ken Wyatt, he's an Indigenous Indigenous Affairs Minister. He's actually said, "Yeah, let's have let's have this Indigenous voice to Parliament in the Constitution. Uh, we've got to make sure that we we've got to get it right." And so, it, it was previously the coalition was was on board with constitutional recognition, but not uh, a voice to Parliament. But now it seems with Ken Wyatt in the role, it seems to be they're on the same page as as Labor now and. Now the objective of the the parties, the, the the bipartisan policy now is is how do we get the public to agree with us so we can have it in the constitution? Yeah, it seems that way. And what what do they think they were going to get by putting someone like Ken Wyatt in that role? I mean, it's obvious that that's what he would he would push. That being of that background, of course, why wouldn't he go for that? Um, what people have to understand also is in this particular situation at hand. The Liberals here uh, continue to try, at least in my 
uh, in what I've been able to see, trying to out left in a lot of ways. You know, with these kind of virtue signals. I mean, not only were they the ones that um, you know, a lot of members at, at the very least of the of the Liberals come out and say, oh, we're the ones who brought in gay, you know, same sex marriage. You know, we're the ones who did it. You know, we achieved this. Um, you have Tim Wilson and other people that do that. And now they're pushing for something like this. And putting Ken Wyatt in there was strategic because the Labor Party came out before the election and said that if they were to win, they were going to put um, Pat Dodson in the role and that he was going to be the, the first Aboriginal uh, minister and it was going to be the Labor Party to do it. So what does Morrison do? Oh, yeah, we're going to make sure we beat him to it. So then we're going to be praised to be the first one to do it. I mean, this, this is the, the childish the childish kind of uh, ways of the Liberal Party here, where they're really just trying to sort of, just out of political point scoring, rather than focusing on principles, they're just trying to get one up on the Labor Party. And now what are they going to get out of it? More progressive change, which I thought they were supposed to be against, seeing as they were supposed to be conservative. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, we haven't even got to the discussion about it, uh, about how this Indigenous voice to Parliament would work in practice, because the last thing we want is a third chamber of Parliament, especially one which is based on race, especially when, well, you know, or you get into trouble if you sort of, you know, discuss, you know, who's who, who's considered uh, Aboriginal enough to, you know, vote for this chamber of parliament and uh, uh what veto power would it have would it have the authority to oversee indigenous programs because of course in the 90s we saw uh at sick the the aboriginal and torres strait islander commission there was there was massive uh financial misappropriation with uh giving out funds for for projects and that it was a complete uh disaster pauline hansen was on the tv uh today reminding everyone of that there's so many problems with its impl implementation it's it's not simply symbolism like it would actually be better if it was just a symbolic meaningless change which didn't affect anything but this indigenous voice of parliament it could potentially upset australia's well, <coughs> westminster system of government change it forever uh, depending on how its implementation is interpreted by courts yeah, well, of course it would. It would be a def definite turnaround and there would be a change. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, what, what they're pushing for. And knowing knowing the Liberals at the very least, they're just going to... Um, in, in any sort of thing that Labor puts forward, they might put something forward and then they'll come to a compromise and then the Liberals will come out and say, oh, yeah, this is a victory. This is a victory for us, you know? I mean, that's what they do. <laughs> but... It's very scary times, you know, I mean, what they're trying to do ultimately, no matter what side of the fence they're on, is they're trying to divide. They're trying to divide and, and conquer um, by the vision of all the different groups of people in society, you know. That's why they're pushing for, you know, they push for same-sex marriage, why they're pushing for Indigenous recognition. They're doing this because they want groups of people to fight each other, to argue over this sort of stuff. I mean, none of this mattered. Once upon a time, everybody was just Australian, you know, everybody was an Australian citizen and this kind of uh, stuff wasn't a concern. And now that it is, everybody's now arguing over semantics and it's stuff that, like you mentioned, is, it could really do a lot of damage. Um, that, that's, that's really, I mean, we even got a lot of people coming out saying that uh, they don't want, you know, uh, people to climb um, as rock because of the disrespect it is to you know the pe the the people that own the rock, you know you know, I never thought that a rock could be owned you know and I thought it was a it That's, was public property but, yeah it's a natural yeah. phenomena <laughs> like they say oh how would uh, you yeah. like it if people climbed the war memorial or St Mary's Cathedral well they're things that humans have built it's a it's a natural rock mm. that appeared mm. in in nature like how can that belong yeah. to anybody. Well, that's right. They didn't actually create the rock. The rock was there from however many years, of, thousands of years it's been there. I mean, it's not something that they built. They didn't have deeds to that particular property that they then built the rock on. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But of course, they'll find a reason to, to go about banning people to climb a rock. I mean, or, or 
you know, something that really is a touristy, uh, something that should bring people in. And it's such a tourist icon, yet they're trying to shut something like that down. There's so many things that of, of negative consequence that can happen um, when I'm hearing constantly with this push of um, of what they were trying to do here with voice to parliament and, and, and all sorts. We just don't know where they're going to go with this. And like uh, Bob Catter and others came out and said recently, this doesn't help them when it comes to jobs. It doesn't help them with education. Um, it, this is just plain virtue signaling. All that money spent just to basically uh, amend some words on the constitution and at the end of the day, they're still going to be in the um, in the position that they're in, which is disadvantaged and not, you know, getting the education they need and not getting the jobs that they needed to be provided with. So this doesn't help them. A lot of money that could be spent elsewhere in actually helping their community. Yeah, true. It's going to be an expensive referendum process and there, there's going to be equal public funding to the yes and the the, the no case but uh, the, the thing is about us changing Australia's constitution is that you have to get the the public to, to vote for it in the end and if they don't want to you can't you can't force them no matter you know bipartisan tripartisan uh, whatever if the people don't want it they won't vote for it and the thing that actually um, it is something else that needs to be erased here is who's going to be the voice of the no. Um, if both uh, Scott Morrison and Bill Shorten agree to, um, to put this forward and be part of the yes campaign, then that's not a balanced approach to this. I mean, a balanced approach is for one of the two leaders to be yes and one of the two leaders to be a no. Um, and if that's not the case, who's willing to be the face of the no campaign? because nobody would want to come forward because they're going to be branded as racist if they are, right? I mean, that's that's the problem, you know? So I'm, I'm actually wondering who's willing to be one of the, the key spokesmen of the no case and someone that would be able to do it in such a way that would be able to explain the consequences and um, do it in a way that actually sounds convincing to the Australian people as to why things shouldn't be changed. Oh, I can think of one, Pauline Hanson, but imagine if she managed to, to win uh, that referendum, majority of Australia voted no, beat Labor, Liberal, Green, all combined in that vote. Well, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I, I mean, Pauline Hanson, um, I don't know if, if that would be the best decision to have her as the face because um, a lot of people that may agree with that decision and don't like her might just purposefully not um, vote that particular way. So I think it would have to be someone that is quite likeable and someone that is able to articulate their points very well and provide uh, definite reasoning as to what they think is um, what well, what is good reasoning uh, behind why things should stay the same and why uh, things changing will be of a consequence. And I don't think that she's someone that's capable of doing that. Um, fair enough, she, she may be an individual with a voice um, on these matters, but I, I just don't think that she's somebody that would be able to successfully be successful in that position. Facebook this week uh, announced a update to their community uh, standards. Uh, now, this related to threats of uh, death and violence, which they said uh, banned on the platform uh, unless these threats are against uh, people Facebook uh, deem as uh, dangerous individuals or the media deems people or, or groups to be violence. So, so basically Facebook was giving the green light that you're allowed to uh, threaten violence and death to certain people that if, if Facebook bans them, then that's okay. So, for example, you could uh, give a death threat against Paul Joseph Watson, Laura Luma, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, the, 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 the Lad Society, anyone who Facebook has banned. And this was like, uh, 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 this was pretty mind-blowing that Facebook thought they had the authority to decree this because publishing a threat of violence or death is illegal in 
pretty much all countries. Like, you can't do it. Like, just because Facebook deems something to be in its community standards doesn't mean you supersede law of nations. I mean, that just shows Facebook's complete arrogance, thinking that they can just, you know, make up the laws of the world. Well, what it does also is it provides um, a, a grim honesty from Facebook as to where they stand, at least when it comes to um, what what particular bias that they're pushing out there and what they think of uh, certain ideologies. And it really confirms to a lot of people, um, well, what the elite, I guess, in general think of um, what you as an individual what your uh, thoughts are, what your uh, political beliefs may be. Uh, basically, in code, it basically says um, that threatening uh, people at any any point is bad unless that person happens to be um, someone that uh, that is labelled uh, far right. I mean, that's what they're basically saying. You know, I mean, in in a in a way that doesn't actually say it, but. <laughs> By saying um, unless the target is um, someone that is considered dangerous, dangerous to whom? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, how exactly is somebody that um, happens to have far-right views dangerous to the community just because those views don't align with particularly um, elite standards, for instance? Um, they're, they're dangerous. I mean, they're not people that commit any violence. Um, they're not... well. Some of them are, but not 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 all of them are, have been in prison. Um, so they're not criminals by any by any state of the mind. And I mean, they're not people that even you know put out threats. They just simply have views that some people can't uh, stomach. So I don't think that that's something that can be considered dangerous just because the, these people have views that are, are seen as taboo. You know, I mean, um, I, it's just it's just a real. A, a real scary thing there that a social media company will come out and say something like that being above the lords uh, I mean I thought everybody was equal of, uh, when it comes to the law but it seems not if you're far right you know if you're far right yeah you, you're allowed to threat and then that's no problem <laughs> Well, Facebook have now amended uh, this policy because I think it was po pointed out to them not just by people online but actual legal officers that you, you can't be basically saying that illegal content is is okay in your community standards and so uh, that, uh, that was quickly amended that policy but it's interesting that Facebook's uh, stuff up on this that comes as the same day as that there's a social media summit at the the White House which is basically a gathering of those who've uh, been been censored by Facebook and other uh, big tech companies they they haven't been uh, invited but uh, the summit's going to ba basically explore ways that uh, uh, social media uh, censorship uh, can uh, be curtailed and we don't have such concentrations of market power. And it was interesting this week that uh, Australia's treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, has said that Facebook and Google, they have too much sway over Australia's internet and it's becoming a danger to our uh, economy and uh, democracy. Well, they are. I mean, this is one example why that's the case. They really do have a big influence in society, and uh, it, it is a scary thing. I mean, Google and Facebook are, are basically in their areas monopolies. I mean, there's not many um, other challenges out there or, or platforms that really pose a challenge to these two. So it, it, it's unstoppable, really, at this current stage. I mean, they have millions and millions of people using using them every day and uh, they put messages out there like this that obviously outlines um a bias of opinion and they try and push these things obviously subliminally but it's something that people were able to uh identify and pick up very quickly and they've you know obviously seen that it didn't work and they've had to retract it it's um they'll, they'll try and do what they can to, to push their points forward, but ultimately it's up to us to point this out and to complain about it and make a, make a statement, because if we don't, then this kind of stuff rides 
and they get away with it. Yeah, and like we spoke about uh, at the beginning with uh, the Jeffrey Epstein uh, co uh, coverage of, of his uh, crimes, it's because uh, I, when we were talking about Facebook and, and Google here, they think they can basically just get away with just casting aside, you know, far right, you know, these, you know, agitators online who are putting out you know, all of this hate speech, but they're realizing they can't get away with it anymore. And it's, it's slow, slowly th seeping through to, to governments who they're now they're, uh, they're getting too powerful, you know, the, the media and the, the social media companies for, for their liking as well. Well, that's right. I mean, it's it's very dangerous. I mean, they're the dangerous ones, really. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about dangerous organisations, I mean, um, they're they're really causing a scene here. And um, these community standards have burnt people hard in the past. I mean, we've always seen examples, and you see this quite often on Facebook, for instance, uh, when people have said something um, against, like that, that that could be called uh, racially vilifying a white person, for instance. And um, they report it and Facebook says, no, nah, this doesn't, you know, that there's nothing wrong um, with this. That's fine. It doesn't go against our community standards. And then they do the same thing against some minority group. And then it automatically is against their community standards. So how does that work exactly? I mean, you either ha when you have standards in place, they're supposed to be the same rules for everybody, but they're not. This is the problem here. I mean, how can you have different rules depending on which group it's affecting? And this is why it's so obvious. And, you know, in, few, in, in the recent times, it's become um, like people make fun of it so, so often now because it's not even hiding it anymore, you know? I mean, when things like this happen, it makes you wonder, well, what's going on? Why are they pushing this sort of rhetoric here? What, what, what's behind it exactly? Why aren't they just doing their job and you know, having this social media platform uh, running the site as intended. Yep, you've got community standards and make sure everybody abides by them. But it just depends on what individual is getting criticised as to what standard, um, if it's being violated or not. And I think that's a pretty dangerous thing, to be honest. Yeah, which is why it's refreshing this week that Facebook uh, had to, to back down on something. Uh, more of that, mm. uh, please. Well, it's been good uh, getting through all the news with you, uh, Damien, catching up on it uh, after uh, my illness. And uh, yeah, the, uh, as always, the news is going to keep coming thick and fast, so we'll be doing another show very soon. Well, thanks for having me, Tim, and I'll be looking forward to it, mate. And that's the show for today. Fingers crossed I'm on the road to recovery and production of the show can pick up again. I've got some great guests lined up in the coming weeks, which I've had to delay, so stay tuned for those. Of course, keep remembering to watch uh, Steel Archer's Detonation program on the Unshackled's YouTube channel. And of course, the Uncuckables will be back live next week on Thursday evenings at 8.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time on its own dedicated YouTube channel. The new gab.com has been launched on the Mastodon social network server. It takes a bit of getting used to, and some gab features are not yet integrated. All of our gabs are still there at gab.com slash the unshackled. We, of course, are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled and at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And we also have our growing Telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember that we rely on the financial support of you, our followers, to produce all of our content. You can pledge over at our patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership. And of course, our donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. And we have also recently launched our Subscribestar account at subscribestar.com slash the unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and I'll see you very soon. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.